Welcome to this lecture on dimensional analysis. We're going to be focusing on the Buckingham Pi theorem and the method of repeating variables in this lecture. This is really where we get into the mechanics of how to do a dimensional analysis. In the next lecture, what we're going to do is use our dimensional analysis to do some modeling and scaling. Uh, but here we'll just kind of focus on the mechanics of it. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at your screen. Uh, the picture here is one I just pulled off the internet. Uh, it's some, um, it's actually a picture of a cityscape. You can see uh, some tall buildings. Let me see if I can highlight this. So you can see some tall buildings in here. Um, and it, it's a scale model that's put into a wind tunnel. So this guy standing in this wind tunnel, the, the wind likely would be blowing from here toward us. And uh, you can see some little structures here in the uh, kind of the background. Those are likely there to cause some turbulence in the flow to represent sort of the surrounding landscape before it comes into the building here. And I believe this particular study was focused on looking at uh, how turbulence uh, in the surroundings affects air intake into the buildings. Uh, so they just built a scale model and then uh, investigated that topic. And so you can see the, the model scale compared to the size of a person here. Um, so anyway, uh, it's amazing what you can find on the internet. But it's a nice example of scale modeling. And dimensional analysis is used in the design of these scale models. So that's why I'm showing you the picture here is because you have to know something about dimensional analysis in order to design these experiments. Uh, because obviously you can't go out and build a bunch of tall buildings and then see how things work. Uh, you know, it's just impractical. Okay, so let's get into the mechanics of how you do a dimensional analysis. We're going to start with some basics here first. Uh, and the very first thing is basic dimensions. Um, I've talked about dimensions before in various lectures, but dimensions are things like mass, length, and time, temperature. They're different from units. Units give some, some quantity to the dimension. So a dimension is a physical quantity like mass. A unit gives a size to that mass, like one kilogram or one pound mass or one slug. Okay, so we're, we're just going to focus on dimensions here rather than units. And a basic dimension is just a dimension um, that's not formed from some combination of other dimensions. Okay, so what I mean by that is, let's say we have mass, oops, let me write this down here. Let's say we have mass, length, time, and force. Okay, those are not all independent dimensions. For example, we can produce a force using a mass, length, and a time squared. A force is a mass length over time squared. That's you know just F equals MA. So these four are not independent of one another. Okay, so they wouldn't they wouldn't all be basic dimensions. And if we got rid of the force, then we have three basic dimensions. Mass, length, and time are all completely independent of one, one another. You can't you can't combine length and time somehow to get a mass. It doesn't make any sense. So a basic dimension is an independent dimension that can't be formed from some combination of the other dimensions, okay? Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning, mentioning basic dimensions is because we're going to talk about things known as reference dimensions in a little bit, and reference dimensions are, are, can be a little different, okay? So the next thing we're going to talk about is the Buckingham Pi Theorem. This is actually the fundamental theorem in uh, dimensional analysis. Uh, and it's named after the guy who developed it. His last name was Buckingham. The pi part just is how, is, when we talk about a dimensionless quantity, um, it's referred to as a pi quantity. I think it was Buckingham that probably originally came up with that uh, notation. So a pi term is a dimensionless term. So the Buckingham pi theorem is just, you know, in honor of the guy that developed it, and it's referring to dimensionless quantities, okay? And we're not going to go through the theorem in detail. I'll just give you what the theorem is. And if you look at your screen, it says the number of pi terms or the number of dimensionless terms is equal to the number of variables that you start with in the dimensional relationship minus the number of reference dimensions required to describe those variables. You know, so I'm saying a lot of words here. Probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense just yet. It'll be very clear when we go through an example. Um, but what I mean by uh, number of variables. So let's say we have some relationship. You know, y is a function of x1, x2, and x3. Okay, so let's say 
that's our relationship between our dimensional variables. The number of variables we have would be 1, 2, 3, 4. Just y, x1, x2, x3. So it's four variables. So that's, that would be our number of variables here. And then the number of reference dimensions. Reference dimensions are the, the dimensions required to describe all of these variables. So let's say for a moment, uh, I, I have this example here. Let's say I have three variables, a, b, and c. Okay, And the dimensions of those variables are given right here. So a is like a density. So it's mass over length cubed. b is like mass over length cubed times squared. c is mass time over length cubed. So when you look at this list of dimensions for those three variables, there are three basic dimensions, mass, length, and time. But it turns out we don't need all three of those independently to describe those three variables. Because if you look for a moment, let me highlight this, you'll see in each one of these we have mass over length cubed. There's a mass over length cubed there, there's one there, there's one there. So we don't need mass and length separately. We just need the combination mass over length cubed to describe those three variables. right? So, so the number of basic dimensions is three because it's just a mass, length, and a time. But the number of reference dimensions to describe those variables is actually two. We need mass over length cubed. That combination is one reference dimension. And then we also need a time because it shows up independently here as well. So that's why we have two reference dimensions. So reference dimensions are a little different than basic dimensions. Okay, Much of the time they're the same, but they can be different. And so you just have to be aware of that. Just make sure you understand the difference between those two. So Getting back to the Buckingham Pi theorem, what we're saying is the number of dimensionless terms required to describe this relationship here. So here you can see we have four dimensional variables. But we can rewrite that expression in terms of dimensionless variables. And the number of dimensionless variables we need will be the number of variables that we start with, four, minus the number of reference dimensions to describe those variables. So that's kind of what I described down here. So we'd figure out what the dimensions are to describe each of these four things and then count the number of reference dimensions. And then we subtract those two things and that gives us the number of pi terms. Again, it'll be very clear when we go through an example. So that tells us just the number of dimensionless terms that we need to describe this original dimensional relationship. We can, we can rewrite it in a smaller number of terms it doesn't tell us what those terms look like. We don't know what the pi terms look like. Um, so that's where the method of repeating variables comes into play. This is just one of several different techniques for finding out what those dimensionless parameters are. It's like an algorithm. You, you, if you follow this algorithm, you kind of turn the crank and you'll be able to figure out what the pi terms look like. So um, I'm going to describe the method of repeating variables here and then we'll apply it to an example so you can see it. And I've got many other examples on, um, that, that I've made uh, PDF copies for and videos. So you'll want to take a look at those so you can see this applied in different uh, scenarios. So step one in the method of repeating variables is to list all the independent variables involved in the problem. So here we have y is a function of x, z, t, some other variables. Um, you want the independent variables. So for example, if I have density, gravity, and specific weight, in my list, those are not all independent. Remember that that specific weight is like a density times gravity. So, so they're not independent. You, you wouldn't want to include one of those. You need them all to be independent. Okay, And then you just make a list of them. You know, this it, we don't know, by the way, we don't know what this function is. Dimensional analysis doesn't tell us the function. Uh, it, it only focuses on the variables involved. To find that function, you have to run experiments or maybe some other analysis, like a linear momentum equation analysis, Navier-Stokes or something, you know, something else. Um, but dimensional analysis won't tell you that function. Okay, it's an unknown. Now I made a bullet point here that this is the hardest step in a dimensional analysis. It sounds kind of funny, just listing out variables. Why is that so hard? But uh, in many situations, it's not always clear what the important variables are. You know, if I was, um, in a lot of the examples that we give you, in the problems we'll give you in this course, we'll just tell you what the variables are. So then it's easy. But in practice, if I was ask, going to ask you, uh, let's, let's say, for example, 
um, we had the flow of grain, like corn, through a silo, like through a hopper, kind of a funnel shape. Um, what variables govern the mass flow rate through that, that hopper? Uh, you know, since you have no experience with it, you don't really know what the right variables are. Maybe the height of the material in the hopper is important. Maybe the diameter of the hopper is important. Maybe the exit diameter is important. Maybe the friction coefficients between the particles are important. You know, you have to think about what are all the important variables. And it's if you have no experience with it, you might not be very good at picking out what the variables are. So this first step is really hard because it requires experience and some insight into the problem. Often you have to do some preliminary experiments just to kind of get a feel for what things are important and what things aren't. So a little exploration actually is sometimes required. Now, in practice, if you get, if you have, um, if you don't get the list of variables right, then what ends up happening is the rest of the dimensional analysis won't really work for you. Uh, we'll get kind of misleading results. So it just, uh, it, it, this is by far the hardest step in the whole thing is just figuring out what the list of variables is. So again, it requires some insight, experience, and some exploration to figure this part out. Okay. Once you have the list of variables, the rest of the procedure is actually pretty straightforward. Um, so the next step is to express each variable in terms of basic dimensions. So that's going back to what we just talked to a moment ago, just uh, you know, mass, length, and time. Those are the most common ones that we encounter, uh, at least for this course. Those are the basic dimensions. So we, we'll do that for every variable. So we'll do it for y, x, z, t, whatever, you know, whatever's in our list. Then the third step is to determine the number of pi terms using the Buckingham pi theorem, which we just discussed. So the number of pi terms is the number of variables that we find from step one minus the number of reference dimensions. So for this, the reference dimensions, we'll go back to this list of basic dimensions and just see what, what dimensions need to be um, involved in order to describe all of those variables. And again, you have to be careful. So maybe like in this example here, maybe some combinations are sufficient. Like here in this one, mass over length cubed was sufficient. We didn't need mass and length separately, but the combination's okay, is, is all we need. So that's why the number of reference dimensions could be different than the number of basic dimensions. Now, the number of pi terms is a unique number that when given the same starting point here, the same equation in step one, the same list of variables, um, the, the um, number of pi terms that we get should be the same for anyone working this problem. It's a unique number. The reason I say that is because there, there's parts to this method of repeating variables that are not unique, and I'll, I'll describe those in a moment. But this is important, it's a unique number. Now step four is where we start to form what these pi terms are. So now we know the number of dimensionless terms or pi terms that we need to have. Step four is where we actually start to figure out what they look like. So the way we find them is we choose what are called repeating variables from our list of variables up here in step one. What, what I mean by repeating variables are, are these are the variables we're going to use to make all the other non-repeating variables dimensionless by. Okay, so um, the... Uh, Sorry, I got distracted. There's something that just showed up on the screen here. So uh, we're, to find these repeating variables, the number that we need of repeating variables will be equal to the number of reference dimensions. Those repeating variables should include all the different reference dimensions. So we need to make sure that, that we have all the ref reference dimensions uh, represented in our list of repeating variables. And then we should choose our repeating variables from the right-hand side of the equation up in step one. You don't want to choose from the left-hand side because what that does is it'll, on the left-hand side, you've got the kind of the de dependent variable in your equation, and you don't want that buried inside all your pi terms. Okay, so you, you want to just choose the independent variables from the right-hand side of the equation as from, for your repeating variables. Okay, again, a lot of this will make more sense when we go through an example. Uh, here is where things are not necessarily unique. So when you choose your repeating variables, different people may choose different variables 
okay? And because of that, the resulting pi terms will look different. You'll all have the same number of pi terms, but the way they look will look a little different potentially. Okay, so don't be alarmed if that occurs. And we'll talk about that some more later on through an example. And then what the next step is, step five, is we, we actually start forming these pi terms. And this one, I, I probably won't say much here at this point because it's, it's kind of confusing if you write it out, but it, when you do the example, it's clearer. But essentially what you do is you take each non-repeating variable multiply by the repeating variables raised to some power and you figure out what those powers are to make the whole thing dimensionless. Okay, you might have to rewind this and listen to what I just said again to, for it to make sense. It's just a lot clearer through the example. So that's all I'm going to say about it at the time uh, for the time being. Step six is just verifying that all of the pi terms we formed in step five are indeed dimensionless. Now if you've done everything correctly in step five, then they should be dimensionless. That's the whole point of step five. But step six is just to catch any little errors you may have made. Just double check that your pi terms are indeed dimensionless. It seems kind of trivial, but just do it because it'll, it'll catch little mistakes. And then step seven is to express the final form of the equation in terms of pi terms. So uh, what I mean is it looks like this pi one is a function of pi two, pi three, etc. Essentially what we're doing is we're taking this equation that we start with Everything in here has dimensions. It's dimensional. They have like mass, length, time, etc. And then what we're doing through the dimensional analysis is we're rewriting this equation in terms of dimensionless terms. It'll still have these variables like y, oops, y, x, z, and t, but they'll be formed in ratios such that the, the ratios are dimensionless. And it's these ratios that are dimensionless that are the pi terms. So we'll just rewrite our equation in terms of those dimensionless ratios here. And just one little note, here you'll see I, I said function two, and up here I said function one. In general, those functions can be different. We don't know what either of them is, okay? Dimensional analysis doesn't tell us that. All we know is that they're just different from one another, okay? And I just, I just wanted to highlight that, highlight that by saying function one and function two. And then the very last thing I'll just say is this equation that we now have in terms of dimensionless parameters, it contains exactly all the same information as the original equation all the way back in step one. Everything in here, it's all the same information as what was in here. It's just rewritten. All we're doing is rewriting our equation so that each term is dimensionless. That's all dimensional analysis does. It's just rewriting the equation. We're not making a new equation. I mean, we're not, we're not introducing new variables or anything like that. We're just rearranging the existing variables so that every term becomes dimensionless. That's all we're doing. So those are the steps involved in the method of repeating variables. Let's go through an example so you can see how it's actually applied. And what I'm going to do is start with a very simple example here, the ballistic equation. Uh, you've seen this many times in physics, right? Um, and the reason I want to do this is because I want to start with an equation where we actually really know what the equation looks like. Um, but I'm going to pretend in my example that I don't know what the equation looks like. What I'm going to pretend is we're going to start with step one. I'm going to, um, I'm going to write down the actual equation in terms of variables. So that y is a function of g, t, y dot naught, and y naught. Okay, so y is the position of, let's, this is like the equation of a, a, a ball being thrown in the air. So the y is the position of the ball, g is the acceleration due to gravity, t is time, y dot naught is the initial velocity, initial vertical velocity of the ball, and y naught is the initial position of the ball, okay? So step one is we just write down that from experience and some preliminary uh, experiment, experiments, some insight, we know that the position of the ball is a function of gravity, time, initial velocity, and initial position. Now we're going to pretend we don't know what this function is. In reality, we do. We, the, the, the real function is right there, but for this purpose, we're going to pretend we don't know it, okay? Now we're going to pretend we don't know it, but we have enough insight to know that these variables are the important variables for the problem. Again, this is the hardest part of the whole analysis, 
is you generally have a hard time figuring out what the important variables are. But we're going to we're going to say that we've done enough uh, an, enough experiments. We have enough experience that we know that these are the important variables. But we don't know what that function is. And, and again, dimensional analysis isn't going to give us that. Um, now, if you want to define what the function was, you know, one logical thing to do would be to go out uh, in the laboratory and run some experiments where you vary the quantities on the right-hand side. So that makes sense. You'd go out, uh, drop a ball from different heights. So you try different y naughts and measure the y as a function of time. Uh, maybe try different initial velocities, go in the lab, measure the position y as a function of time. And then uh, gravity. OK, so how are you going to vary gravity? Well, you could go you know, to your boss and say, well, I need to, I need to book some time on uh, the KC-135. This is the Vomit Comet. This is this aircraft that goes in parabolic trajectories and uh, you know, gives you basically a, a low gravity environment for about 30 seconds or so at a time, maybe a minute at a time. And so you're going to have to book some time on that to run your experiments at reduced gravity. Maybe you, you could book some time on a centrifuge so you can have increased gravity conditions. Now you're starting to get into some very expensive experiments, right? You're, if you go to your boss and say you need to do this, they're going to be very reluctant because it's just so costly and time consuming. Uh, they're not going to want to do it. So you start to immediately run into problems because you don't know how to vary gravity in your experiments. Even if you could, let's think about the number of experiments you'd have to perform. Um, let's say you want, if you could run experiments where you vary each one of these independently. And let's say you wanted to, to get five, five data points for each of the four variables. So you have four variables, and you want to vary each one five different times to get, get a good feel for your experiments. And ultimately, what you're trying to do is you know, measure y as a function of time, where you have a certain g, y naught, y dot naught value. And then you kind of measure the, the position as a function of time. right? You do this five times. And then, you've, then you have another value for g, and then another value for y naught, and another value for y dot naught. And you know, so you have your, your four variables, you vary each one five times. The number of experiments you'd have to perform would be five raised to the fourth power, which is 625, I believe it is. Um, I've got that written down somewhere, but I think that's the right number. Yeah. That's a lot of experiments you're going to have to perform. Again, if you go back to your boss and say, I need to perform 625 experiments to figure out what this functional relationship is. By the way, some of them are going to have to be done on the KC-135 or maybe even in the space station. And then some of them are going to have to be done on a centrifuge. They're not going to let you do it. Okay, It's just too much. You know, It's too time consuming, too much money. It, it totally makes sense what you're describing, but it's just not practical. Okay, So there, we, need to, we need to find a better way. And our dimensional analysis is the better way. And, and you'll see that at the end of this. OK, so anyway, step one, write out what all the variables are in its dimensional form. And by the way, when I say dimensional form, you'll see here y has dimensions of length, g has dimensions of length over time squared, t, of course, is a time, so on and so forth. They all have dimensions associated with it. So now let's go to step two. Step two was to re let's figure out what um, each variable is in terms of basic dimensions. So the way I like to do this is I, I draw square brackets around the variable. And that just means the dimensions of y. So the dimensions of y will be a length, because y is just a position. So it's a length. Dimensions of g are length per time squared, like, like meters per second squared. It's a length over time squared. Dimensions of t are just time. Dimensions of y dot naught are length per time. That's a velocity, so it's a length per time. And dimensions of y naught or length. So that's step that's step two. Okay, pretty straightforward. And again, you want to use dimensions that are independent from one another. Don't use mass, length, time, and force. Put everything in terms of mass, length, and time, for example. You want these dimensions to be independent of one another. Now step three is to find the number of pi terms using um, the Buckingham pi theorem. So let's write that out. So the number of pi terms 
Again, a pi term is just a dimensionless term. The number of pi terms is the number of variables that we start with minus the number of reference dimensions. The number of reference dimensions required to describe those variables. So the number of variables is pretty straightforward. We go back up to our list here. You'll see we have one, two, three, four, five. So the number of variables is just five. And the number of reference dimensions, um, we go back to step two and just take a look at what kind of dimensions we need to describe all of these variables. So here you'll see we definitely need a length. Okay, We definitely need a time for that one. Well, over here, we already have a length, so we've already got that one. Here we have a length and time. Well, we've already accounted for both of those. Same here, length and a time, we've account accounted for both of those. So the number of dimension reference dimensions I need to describe my variables is two, length and time. So our number of reference dimensions in this case is two. And I'll just put length and time here just to remind me that those are my two reference dimensions. So that means that we will have three pi terms. So what that means is our original equation, which involved five terms, we can somehow rearrange it so that it only has actually three terms. So we can, we can shrink the size of that equation, which is a big deal. Okay, We'll come back to that later. So now we need to figure out what these pi terms are. And by the way, the, the number three here, the number of pi terms, anyone working this problem who starts with the same list of variables as in step one should end up having the same number of pi terms. Okay. So now to find what the pi terms are, we're going to do our method of repeating variables here. Um, so this is the step that I, I told you is probably best figured out by example. So, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so this is, so steps four and five are where we kind of do the, the meat of the algorithm here. So step four is to choose repeating variables. Okay, so the number of repeating variables I have to choose is equal to the number of reference dimensions. So I need two of them. So I'll make a note here, need two is equal to the same, uh, same as the number of, uh, let me rewrite this. Need the same number as number of reference dimensions. So in this case, I need two of them. And I want to make sure that they include a length and a time separately. And I want to choose them from the right-hand side of my equation in step one. Okay, so this part is not unique. So in my, the, the two that I'll choose is, I'll, I'll choose a Y naught, and I'll also choose G. Those will be the two that I'll choose. Why those two? Well, Y naught, Okay, so first of all, both y naught and g are from the right-hand side of the equation. Um, I chose y naught because it involves just a length. Okay, so I because remember in my reference dimensions, I need to make sure I have a length. So the y naught has that length. And for the second one, I'll choose g um, because g involves a time here. Uh, you don't have to use g. If you wanted to, you could have used t or y dot not because those involve time as well. Perfectly fine. This is why this step is not unique. Okay, Th these are the two that I chose. So we'll stick with those. But you could choose other ones. What you don't want to do is don't choose like, um, well, you don't want to choose from the left hand side of the equation y because then it'll be buried inside your y, your pi terms and we don't like that. That's the dependent variable and we don't want that buried inside our equation on both sides of the equation. Um, so you don't want to do that. Um, and the other reason you wouldn't want to choose like why and why not is because they're both lengths uh, and they don't, you need to make sure you get a time in there too. Okay. So anyway, these are our repeating variables that I've chosen. Yours may be different. So now what we're going to do is we're going to form pi terms. Okay. And so what we do is we go through each non-repeating variable and we multiply it by the repeating variables raised to some power. We, it's our job to figure out what those power uh, values are to make the whole expression dimensionless. So let's just start 
with our first pi one term. I'm going to start with my first non-repeating variable, which is y. I'm going to work my way from left to right through this equation. So my non-repeating variables will be y, t, and y dot naught, because my repeating variables are g and y naught, so I don't have to worry about those. It's, I'm, I need to make the y dimensionless, the t dimensionless, and y dot naught dimensionless using my repeating variables. So I'm going to take my y, multiply it by y naught raised to a power, and g raised to a power. So I'm taking my non-repeating variable, multiplying it, multiplying it by my repeating variables, each raised to some power. I don't know what the a and the b are here. I'm going to have to figure those out. And I want to figure out what a and b are to make everything dimensionless. Okay, so since I'm referring to the dimensions here, um, let me write this down, then I'll describe what I'm doing here. But the dimensions of pi 1, I'm going to write like this, length and time raised to the 0 power. Let me write this down, and I'll describe it all in just a moment. Okay, so what I've done in this step right here is I've written down my the equation right above it, but in terms of dimensions. So let me start on the right-hand side. It's probably easier there. So the dimensions of y are just length, or length raised to the 1 power. It's just a length. The dimensions of y naught raised to the a power would be a length raised to the a power. The dimensions of g raised to the b power would be length over time squared raised to the b power. So you're kind of getting how this works. The dimensions of the pi term, remember it's dimensionless, that would be like a length raised to the 0 and a t raised to the 0, because anything raised to the 0 power is just equal to 1. It means it, 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 there are no dimensions left over. When it's raised to the 0 power, it doesn't have any dimensions anymore. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to figure out what the a and b are to make, uh, to make this side of the equation dimensionless. So, that, so it's like having length to the 0 and t to the 0. So the way we do that is we can look at the um, lengths and times separately. So, and then uh, equate the uh, exponents so that the uh, dimensions go away. So the, let me just show you what I mean by this. So let's just focus on the exponents associated with the length. So on the left-hand side, we have a 0 here. On the right-hand side, you can see there's an L to the 1, so I'm going to put a 1 here. Here we have length to the A, so I'm going to add in an A. And then finally, we have a length to the B, so then we'll have a B here. So what I want to do is be able to raise this L to some power and this L to some power, such that when you um, combine all these together, they add up to zero, so that it's like L to the zero power. Okay, hopefully this is clear. And I'll do the same thing with the time. On the left-hand side, we have time to the zero power, so that's going to be zero. On the right-hand side, well, this one doesn't have time, that one doesn't have time. Here we have time in the denominator squared, and then the whole thing raised to the B power. That's like going to be to the minus 2B. The minus is because it's in the denominator, it's like t to the minus 2 power. The squared, of course, is there. But when you, when you take a power, then you raise it to a power, then they multiply together. Um, and when you, when you multiply two variables together, and each is raised to a power, then it's like adding the exponents together. Okay, so, and what we, again, want to do is find the choice of a and b such that um, they, they end up giving us the zero power, like on the left-hand side here. So you can quickly see that b is going to have to be zero. And if we know b is zero, that top one tells us that a has to be minus one. So what that means is, is our first pi term looks like y times y naught to the one, minus one times g to the zero, because I've just substituted in for a and b here. Well, g to the zero, that's just, just one. So we're just left with y over y naught as our first pi term. Okay, that makes sense, right? Um, if y has dimensions of length, y naught has dimensions of length, it's now dimensionless. Right? And that, that was our goal, is we're trying to make each non-repeating variable dimensionless using our repeating variables. So we just did our first one. Let's move on to the next one, okay? So the first one was pretty easy. 
The next one, let's go back up to our list. So we, we did our first non-repeating variable. Let me highlight the non-repeating variables in green. So that's a non-repeating variable. There's one and there's one. So our next one is going to be t. So let's do the same procedure. We have a non-repeating variable multiplied by our repeating variables, each raised to a power. I'll write down the, uh, the, the dimensions associated with each variable. So the pi term, it's like length to the zero, t to the zero. The right-hand side, we have t raised to the one, l raised to the a, and then l over t squared raised to the b, just like what we did in the first uh, pi term. Now we'll go ahead and look at each dimension separately. So for the lengths on the left-hand side, we have zero. On the right-hand side, we have a plus b. You can see t to the zero, oh, I'm sorry, uh, l. l to the zero, and then we have l to the a, so that's that a. L to the B, so there's that B. Let's do the time. Left-hand side, it's 0. Right-hand side, we have a 1 minus 2B. We have 0 here on the left-hand side. T to the 1, so there's the 1 there. T to the minus 2 raised to the B power, so that's minus 2B there. So then when you solve for B in this equation, it comes out to be a 1 half. And then because B is 1 half, you see that a is going to have to be a minus one half. So our pi two term is t times y naught to the minus one half times g to the one half. I'm just plugging in for a and b here using what I had there, so that's what this is. Or just writing it in a slightly different way, t times the square root of g over y naught. That is my pi two term. Okay, so that should be a dimensionless quantity if I've done everything correctly. Now we have one last pi term. Remember that from the Buckingham pi theorem, we should have three of them. We've done two. Let's do the last one. And our last non-repeating variable is the y dot naught term. So let's form a pi term out of that one. So pi three is y dot naught times y naught raised to the a times g raised to the b put it in terms of dimensions. y dot naught will be like length over time. y naught is length raised to the a and g is l over time squared raised to the b. We'll, come, we'll just look at the length term. So on the left hand side it's 0. On the right hand side it's 1 plus a plus b. We'll do the time terms. On the left hand side it's 0. On the right hand side we have a minus 1 minus 1 because we have this t in the denominator, so that's to the minus 1 power. And then we also have the minus 2b coming from the gravitational acceleration term. So then we solve for b here, that'll be a minus 1 half. And then if that's a minus 1 half, then that tells me that the a has to be, let's see, that'll be, a will also be a minus 1 half. So my pi 3 term will be y dot naught times y naught to the minus one half times g to the minus one half or just rewriting it it's y dot naught all over the square root of y naught times g. That is my third pi term. I'm running out of space so let me put in another page here. So that's my third and final pi term. Okay, so this was our step five in our method of repeating variables algorithm. Now step six is just to verify that everything is in fact dimensionless. If you've done everything correctly, this should all be dimensionless, but this is just kind of our double check. So what I'll do is I'll go up to my first pi term and I see, okay, this is a length over length, so it's like length over length. Well, those will cancel out, so it's, it's okay, it's dimensionless. Let's go to our second pi term. This would be like a time times the square root of length over time squared all over length because a t is there, g is this length over time squared, y naught is a length. Now if I look at that, that length will cancel out. Let me make that look a little better. This length cancels out with that length. And then I'm left with t times 1 over time squared square root. So this will these will cancel out. So that one's okay as well. And then the last one, 
got a velocity in the numerator. Denominator is the square root of length times length over time squared. So this would be like length over time all over length squared over time squared, square root. So just length over time all over length over time. So that's good. So this one's okay as well. So step six was just verifying that everything's dimensionless, and it is. Don't skip that step. It seems kind of trivial, but it's just a good way to kind of double check any sort of simple mistakes you may have made. Now step seven is to rewrite our original expression now in terms of pi terms. So let me rewrite our original expression just so you can remember it. Let me go all the way back up here. So that's our original, our original expression. So y is some function. We don't know what that function is. We're pretending. It's equal to, to it's some function of g, t, y dot, not, and y not. And now what we're saying is that we can rewrite that equation in the following form, where pi 1, which was y over y naught, is some function, it's a different function than the first one in general, of our other pi terms. Um, so the second pi term was t times g over y naught. And then our third pi term was y dot naught over the square root of y naught times g. So that's our step seven is right there. This, this is like pi one is equal to a function of pi two and pi three. So what we've done here is we said that our original expression, y is a function of these four variables. We can rewrite that equation. I don't know what the equation is, what the function is, but I know that I can rewrite it like this. Okay, and all I've done is just rearrange the variables so that they're all dimensionless. This is dimensionless, that one's dimensionless, that one's dimensionless. Now, if you look at this for a second, we've really simplified the problem. You go back to your, you know, the idea of having to run experiments, right? We said we had these, um, these four variables, we're going to vary them five different times and then kind of make the measurements, etc. And sometimes those experiments would be hard because you have to vary gravity. But now let's think about what we're doing. Now our experiments, instead of involving four variables, we only have to involve two variables, right? Now it's kind of like magic. We've reduced the number of terms that we have to vary. Instead of four, we're just going to vary two things. And it's a lot easier to vary these things. So like, for example, if I wanted to vary this one, my pi two term, it's easy to vary because time just varies. It just naturally varies, no problem. If I wanted to vary this term, I could vary the initial speed or I could vary the initial height. I don't have to vary gravity in any of my experiments. So I don't have to vary gravity independently at all. So it really simplifies how I run my experiments. So I have a lot fewer experiments. So here instead of, uh, so here up here we had four variables and we wanted five different measurements. So we had five raised to the four, 625 different experiments, many of which might be hard. But now I've got two variables that I'll vary five different ways. So that would be um, five raised to the two power, which is just 25 experiments, far, far fewer experiments. and. I don't have to worry about varying gravity because if I want to vary this term, I just vary time or y naught. And if I vary this, if I want to vary this term, I just vary y dot naught or y naught. I don't have to vary gravity at all. So they're easy experiments and far fewer of them. And I guarantee you, if you go back to your boss, so let's say you know your colleague went in and said I had to do 625 experiments and vary gravity, uh, but then you come in afterwards and say, you know what, you only need 25 experiments. You don't have to vary gravity. We can do this out in the lab. It's going to be very easy. Your boss is going to love you, and you're going to get a raise and accolades, and um, you'll you'll just be wonderful. Everybody will love you. So that's why you want to do dimensional analysis is so so that everyone loves you. Okay. Gosh, I hope that's not the reason why you do it. But anyway. So it's kind of like magic here. You know, I, whenever I go through this, it, it always seems kind of amazing that you can do this kind of simple dimensional analysis and really make your life so much easier as a result. Just to kind of double check that it all makes sense, um, let's just 
convince ourselves that this works because we know what the real equation looks like, right? If you remember, the real equation is the ballistic equation, right? We know that the real equation looks like this. Right, that's the real equation. Um, and you can see, you know, all the, the variables involved, G, T, Y dot, not, Y not, and Y. But let's just rearrange that equation so that our variables look like this. Okay, so for example, I can divide through, let me divide through by the Y not. Okay, so I have Y over Y not. It's equal to minus one half uh, G, T squared over Y not plus Y dot not t over y naught plus 1. Okay, so let me do the next thing. Um, well, if you look at this one, this minus 1 half gt squared y naught, that's really like t times the square root of g over y naught square rooted and that whole thing squared. Right? That's this term. So that, all I've done is that. Just I've just rewritten this. You can see this one, this y over y naught is this term here, our pi one term. And then um, our y dot naught times t over y dot naught, um, we could write that one as like this, just combine together a couple of pi terms. You can see that if I, let's see, let's make sure I did this correctly. If I multiply these together, the g's cancel out, the, um, the y naught square roots, just make it a y naught in the denominator. There's my t, and there's my y dot naught. So, so here's, the, here's this, oh, and then I have to put in the plus one. So all I've done is I've just rewritten our ballistic equation. I just rewrote it. It's the exact same equation, right? It's the exact same equation. I just rewrote it so that it, it involved my pi term. So you can see that this equation here has all of the same information as this equation. All I did, with, all we were really doing is just rearranging the variables so that they're all dimensionless. So here it is in our, in terms of our pi term. So here's our pi one term. Let me highlight each one separately so you can see it. So here's pi one. Here's my pi two term right there that shows up here. And I put it there as well. And then my pi three term is this one. And that, that one's right there. I don't know why I turned it into a circle. There we go. So hopefully you're convinced that uh, this, this whole thing works, that, that we can just rearrange our original dimensional equation and make it dimensionless. And, uh, and you see that we have fewer terms to deal with here because of our dimensional analysis. All right, so I've already told you that you can really simplify the experiments, right? Because we went from 625 experiments down to 25, and the experiments are easier to perform, like gravity here, for example, okay? Let me show you that you can also present the data a lot more compactly. So imagine we run these experiments, okay? So let's say that you have a very, um, your company has deep pockets, you have lots of money, and your, your boss um, just lets you run your experiment, your 625 experiments, and then lets you go on the KC-135 and run those experiments too. So let's pretend that you have a very generous company that you work for. You go out and you gather the data. So this is what that data may look like. <clears throat> um, we have the position, this should not be Y naught, that should just be Y. Apologize for that. But let's say you, you go out, um, your first set of experiments is at ordinary gravity. So you can see G is 9.81. Um, you go out and you try three different elevations, 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters. These are your initial elevations. And you're doing three different initial velocities. So here's zero, minus one meter per second, minus two meters per second. And then you measure the height of your ball as a function of time. And you'll get plots like this. So here's your time axis here, your ball height here. You're starting from your three different initial positions and the three different colors correspond to the different speeds. Okay, so that's one set of experiments that you perform. 
This is at one gravity, and you have to do this for different gravities, right? So then here's a, a half gravity. You run the same experiments, you know, three different heights, three different speeds, and you measure the height as a function of time. And then you do it at another gravity. So here's a, a different gravity value. Three different heights, three different speeds for each height, measure the position as a function of time. So here's all of the data that you've gathered from all of those experiments. There's a lot of information here. Right? You've got to collect all that information. But you have it, and it's in these plots. If you instead presented it in dimensionless form, if you took that same data, and instead of presenting it in terms of your dimensional variables here, if I just took that same data and made it dimensionless in the manner that we, you know, our different pi terms here, then we can really present it in a much more compact manner. And if you do that, those three plots all simplify down to this. Okay, it's, it's kind of remarkable to think about it, but here we have our dimensionless position, y over y naught, this is our pi one term. Here's the dimensionless time, this was our pi two term, that's the time times the square root of g over y naught. And then over here, the three different curves, this was our pi three term. This was our y dot naught all over the square root of g y naught. So you can see this plot actually contains all of the same data, all of the same data as what's in these three plots up here. It's kind of hard to believe, but it contains all the same information. It's just in a much more compact form when you present it in a dimensionless form. Okay, if you took all the curves up here and you made it dimensionless, if you took your y and divided by y naught and your t and made that, you know, in your pi two term and your y dot naught values, and you know, just crunched all those numbers and made it you know, put it in dimensionless form, it would all fall on to these three curves. So it's, it's pretty remarkable. So if you remember in the last lecture, I gave different reasons why you want to do a dimensional analysis. The first reason was because you can really simplify your experiments, which we just talked about. Second reason is because you can present your data much more compactly and efficiently, which I've just shown you here on the screen. The third reason is because you can now start to do some scale modeling. Now we haven't talked about that yet. That'll be in the next lecture. Okay, so, so that's the next one. The fourth reason was because you get a little better insight into, into which variables are really significant in your problem. Um, that one's a little more subtle, but all I'll say about that right now is really in our the physics of our problem you don't care about gravity, time, and why dot not, and why not all separately. Instead, it's these combinations of variables that really are most important into the physics of the problem. That, that's a kind of a subtle point and hard to understand. Don't worry about it too much. It's not something that um, we'll dig deep into in this course. But, but it just kind of shows you that in the world of physics, it's not individual parameters that usually are important. It's, it's ratios of parameters that become important, you know, something relative to something else that's kind of significant. Okay, let's see if I've missed anything I wanted to cover. Uh, I think we're pretty good. Oh, I, I guess there is one last thing I want to mention. Uh, you know, when I went through my dimensional analysis, I chose these variables as my repeating variables. Okay, now you may want to go through this example again and choose different repeating variables. So, for example, if you did um, if you did this problem, instead of using y naught and g, perhaps you used y dot naught and g. That would work perfectly fine. You have a length and a time separately in, in those quantities. Um, you can certainly work out the problem that way. What you would get in the end is you would get a different set of pi terms. It would look a little different than what I have here. Okay, But it would, there would still be three of them. You'd have pi 1 as a function of pi 2 and a pi 3. It's just your pi terms would look a little different. That's fine. The, 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 what your pi terms look like is not necessarily unique. What's unique is the number of pi terms. Now that being said, you could take your pi terms and turn them into someone else's pi terms by multiplying together pi terms, maybe flipping, uh, raising them to some power, dividing them. You can combine pi terms to form new pi terms. The only restriction is that you have three dimensionless terms. That's it. You should have three dimensionless terms. The dimensionless terms 
can look like anything. They just have to be dimensionless and you need to have three of them. So you should be able to combine together your pi terms to form someone else's pi terms in some way. So for just a quick example of that, if I have, um, let's say my, my pi 2 term was t times the square root of g over y, y naught. I could make a new pi term, pi term uh, 2 prime, and just square it. Perfectly fine. I could have rewritten my, my, my expression here. Instead of using this pi term, I could have used that one. Totally fine. It's still a pi term, still dimensionless, and I still have three of them. I could have, I could have flipped it upside down. I could have made a new pi term. Let's call it pi 2 double prime. I could have made it 1 over t times the square root of y naught over g. All I did was just flip this upside down right here. So I could have rewritten this in terms of this, this term. Totally fine. It's still a dimensionless term, and I still have three of them. I could have even uh, multiplied these two together. So I could make my pi 2 triple prime. I could just combine this pi term, multiply it by the, my other pi term. Oops, uh, let me fix that. Multiply those two together, and let me see if I can uh, quickly multiply it. So this will be t y dot naught all over y naught. Yeah, that's what I get. So my pi 2 triple, tr you know, so I could have made that my pi 2 term here instead. Totally fine. It's still a dimensionless quantity, and I still have three of them. So you can combine these together, and by the way, you'll see this is dimensionless because it's like a velocity times a time, which is a length divided by a length. Still a dimensionless term. I still have three of them. Perfectly fine. So you can combine uh, pi terms, flip them upside down, raise them to some power. Uh, it's totally fine. And sometimes you do that just to make convenient groupings of terms. Uh, there are certain groupings of terms that show up frequently in fluid mechanics just over and over again. And so it's nice. Give me one second here. Uh, I've got my daughter just showed up in this video, so um, sorry about that. I'll get back to you later. So anyway, you can use these different pi terms. Uh, you can combine these pi terms in different ways, and it's totally fine. It's just that you need to have three of them in this example, and they need to be made dimensionless. or They, they need to be dimensionless, and you need to have the right number from the Buckingham pi theorem. Sorry, I got thrown off from my daughter just showing up. All right. We'll end the, the lecture here. In the next one, we'll focus on that very last reason why we want to do dimensional analysis, and that is the modeling part of it, how we, how we use dimensional analysis to do scale modeling. And I'll continue from this example, um, this ballistic equation example for that modeling part. The other thing that you might want to do is start looking through the examples that I give, uh, that I've made videos for, as well as some PDF copies to see how you use this procedure. It's, it's, once you've done this once or twice, it, it's very, uh, it, it becomes very straightforward on how to do it. All right, we'll go ahead and end it there.